I love where we are. I love uh, the series. I, I love that we're just opening up scripture. We're letting scripture speak for itself, which is a little bit different than coming with an idea to scripture and letting, you know, you and I trying to find a confirmation and some of that, some of that works sometimes, but there's something more profound, more beautiful about opening scripture and letting scripture just tell us its story. Uh, it, I liken it to, you know, like hearing a story secondhand or hearing a story from a friend of a friend, right? Like friend number one went to Cleveland, friend number two didn't go, but it's like, oh, let me tell you the story. I wish I would have gone, it's crazy. Did you hear about the airport? deal and did you hear about the debacle with the uber and the weird water feature with the airbnb and you're like no i didn't hear about that but like why why are you going to friend number two why don't you go to friend number one who went to cleveland i don't know why cleveland but let's just say cleveland would be a destination you guys get where i'm going right and so we we've been in these uh these series of conversations this collection of talks and really the the heart behind this is to remind ourselves that god longs to put inside of us a defiant faith a, a a godly defiance in which when we see our life or we live our life and we make decisions for our life, we're not making decisions primarily what we see with our natural eyes, though we're making decisions primarily with what God's doing in the unseen places. And, and during this series, we're, we're just, we're anchoring ourselves to these even though I will verses, which are some of my favorites. Verses like Psalm 23, where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so with my natural eyes, I'm seeing that I'm in the valley. I don't want to be in the valley. It feels like death. I want to get out of here. But with my natural eyes, I'm seeing that I'm walking in the valley of the shadow of death. But then there's this defiant comma. But I will not fear. Why? Because you're with me. Or the psalmist goes on and says, even though an army besieged me. So I'm seeing with my natural eyes and everybody else around me seeing that there's opposition coming towards my life. But then the defiant comma says, but my heart will not fear. Or one of my favorites is Habakkuk 3. And if you're memorizing scripture, I hope that you are. This is one you want to put on the list. It says, even though the fig tree does not bud and there's no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails and there's no food in the field, even though there's no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stall. So I'm seeing with my natural eyes, there's lack. But then the defiant comma, but I will rejoice in the Lord. And the point is every one of us, we're, we're going to step into some seasons, whether we like it or not, by the way, in which there is lack, there is pain, there is a kind of disillusionment. And you and I have got to come to the place where we know our faith is going to be tested. And, and I hate to say this, but either your faith is going to come out as a bumper sticker or a token, or it's going to be the kind of faith that ignites under pressure. It's going to be the kind of faith that that either crumbles under the weight of people pleasing or being culturally relevant, or it, it's the kind of thing that you anchor your entire life to, where we can say with a, a, a faith where even though, even though I'm barely standing in this storm, there's a defiant comma, but I know you're with me. I know you're gonna sustain me. God, even though I'm experiencing the worst fears of my life, being realized, I know you're going to make a way for me. And this series, it's really deeply personal. It's personal to me. I'm hoping it's personal to you. Today in particular, I think is going to be very personal. Some of you, in fact, you're going to be like, did somebody text him, you know, or call me with my story? And I just want you to know, thankfully, nobody texted me. Nobody uh, called me. You're happy to, I'm happy for you to call me or text me, but nobody did that today. And, and what you, want to, what you need to know today is that even though you're coming in maybe anonymous, you're not anonymous to God. God, God, God knows your name today. Amen. He knows that you're here today. He, he wants you and is inviting you into a kind of freedom that maybe you've never experienced before in your entire life. And what's amazing is it, what it doesn't require is a boatload of faith. Like you, you don't have to come in today you know, like psyching yourself up in the car, being like, okay, I'm just going to believe. I'm going to believe. I'm going to blow. I just know that I know that I know that God's going to do a miracle. Like, you don't have to, that doesn't have to be the case for you. In fact, the Bible essentially says that you can have the, the faith the size of a grain of sand. I mean, in particular, what it says is that faith the size of a mustard seed can move an entire mountain. 
So the message today is this. Even though I fall, I will rise. Now, just for clarity, this message is not for those of you that have never fallen, okay? And it's not for those of you that are like religious and you're like, you know, uh, you know I've fallen once or twice. I, I remember one time I was 15, I got caught lying to my mom. And then one recently, I'm kind of embarrassed about, I've got a really long overdue library book. It's been under the seat of my car for like three months. So this message is going to be super relevant for it. It's like, no, 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 this is for the people that are actually telling the truth. This is, this is for those of you that have fallen, and you've fallen again, 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 and you've fallen again. There is a, a well-paved road of self-destruction, and you've got the scabs and the scars as a testimony of how many times and how often and how far you have fallen And unfortunately, you've gotten really good at covering that up. But even worse than that, you've actually begun to believe a lie that is so dangerous. And the lie is this, is this is just what I do. I'm a person that falls. I'm a person that falls again. Because the rising and the getting up and the staying up, it's it's just for other people. And I want to be the guy today, if if you'll let me, to stand on the truth of God's word. And I just want to hold out a promise for you. If you're a son and daughter of God, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, this is a promise for you. And the promise is is Proverbs 24, 16. Again, if you're memorizing scripture, anybody want to say it with me? And I hope that you are. Uh, This this is going to be the one you want to put right to the top of the list this week. It says, even though a righteous man falls seven times, he will rise again. Even though a righteous man falls seven times, he will rise again. I want to unpack that idea briefly today out of Micah chapter 7. So if you've got a copy of the scripture, I'd love for you to turn there with me. Here's this, this minor prophet making this confession, which is our confession, which is our story. Verse 8, he says... Do not gloat over me, my enemy, though I have fallen. In other words, there, there, and hopefully you're seeing this. There's no qualifier here of like how he fell or how long he fell or how many times he fell. But here's what we know. No matter what your qualifier is, we know that falling hurts. It leaves a mark. So don't gloat over me, my enemy, though I have fallen, I will Rise, And then he amplifies this with a kind of faith. What faith is, is not seeing with the natural eyes. Faith is seeing in the unseen place. So, though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. And again, this is, this is my story. I don't have time to go deeply into my story today. But this is your story today as well. It's all of our stories. And, and the reminder that I love so much is that no matter how many times you've fallen, whether it's seven times or 70 times, no matter how far you have fallen, what disqualifies us is not the falling. What disqualifies us is not reaching out to the one who can rescue us. And so he says, though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Now, the good news, as you're reading this, hopefully, at least part of the good news is, because nobody likes to be the first, but you're not the first to fall. Anybody want to say amen to that? You're not the first to fall. In fact, our great, 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 I don't know how many greats. I should know that. Grandparents in the garden, you can read about this in Genesis 3. They're the first to fall, and it was an epic fall. However far you've fallen, it's not even close to how far they've fallen. They literally were walking with God face to face in the cool of the garden, naked and unashamed, which sounds pretty amazing. perfect life, perfect wife, perfect future, and then they just torpedoed their own life. And then their fall then had like epic consequences on the rest of us. I mean, the very thing that happened, I mean, at least in part, is that when they sinned, then they imputed sin to the rest of us. And the very reason we have cancer, the very reason 
There is a terminal insecurity in every one of us. The reason racism is rampant is because our great, great, great grandparents fell. And maybe just a little parenthesis, this is not the message, but the little parenthesis is like when we fall, it has consequences on other people. But that's not what I want you to focus on today because there's a little bit of guilt attached to that. What I want you to ask the question, the question I want you to ask is, well, how do I rise? Falling is easy. It's the rising that feels impossible. And so Micah answers this. It's not going to be what you think. He says, so he's like, okay, I've sinned against God. He says, wait, I think I've skipped a verse here. No, I haven't. Sorry. He says, until, which is the hinge verse here in the entire passage. This is the hinge verse. You can circle that or highlight that in your Bible. He says, until he, now he's, he's talking about God. Until he pleads my case and establishes my cause. Okay, so here, here's the thing. Actually, I think I did skip a verse. Sorry, guys. I was like, that's not right. Listen, there's a lot of pressure being up here. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Excuse me, look at verse 9. Here's how we rise. I skipped ahead. He says, because I've sinned. So here's, here's how you rise. He says, because I've sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath. Okay, so here's the thing. We've all fallen. I've fallen. You've fallen lots of times. And what is necessary in our falling is to make the confession, I've fallen. To, to be able to say, I've sinned. And it's not just enough, and I want you to hear this for all the religious people in the room. It's not enough just to be like, well, I've made a mistake, and, and I, I, I did some, some dumb things, and, and I torpedoed my own life. But no, you, you, it, and this requires a lot of gospel humility. You've got to be able to say, I've sinned against God. I mean, sure, I sinned against other people, but I first sinned against God. And I broke his laws. I broke his commands. I tarnished his glory. And so I sinned against him. And then here's what's so painful. I've sinned against him. And hello, I deserve his wrath. Which you're not going to find a devotional at Barnes & Noble, like with that title. Like I've sinned against God. I deserve his wrath, right? 75 devotionals of hope, right? Like you're not going to see that. And so on the front end of this, what I want you to hear is that the posture of our God is always grace. We deserve his wrath, but his posture is always grace. His posture is always to give us what we don't deserve. His posture is always to leave the 99, to go after the one. But what I I don't want you to diminish is the reality that God is perfect and he is holy. And when you and I sin, we first sin against God. We are raising a flag of rebellion against the creator of the universe. And we deserve everything that's coming to us. Now, the reason that matters so much is that if if you can't own your own sin, if you can't really be like, this is mine, I did it, I deserve everything that's coming to me from God, if you can't own your sin, listen, you can't be saved. And if you're not saved, then then you miss out on all the promises of God that he has secured for us in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And if you're not saved, meaning if you haven't said yes to Jesus and surrendered your entire life to him, if you're not saved, then you're still going to receive something from God. Like John Calvin calls it common grace. In this life, the, 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 the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's going to be blessings and kindness and beautiful things that happen to you, whether you follow Jesus or not. But what you will ultimately receive from God in eternity is wrath and eternal separation and punishment. But let me just tell you, that's not his game. He's not eager to do that. 
The Puritans would say that God's wrath is his reluctant character. He doesn't want to do it. But to satisfy the brokenness and the rebellion in our heart, sin's got to be paid for. And so the question is like, okay, how, how, do, I, how do I rise with that? I've sinned. This is what Mike is saying. He's like, okay, I've sinned against God. I've fallen. How do I rise? Well, he says this. This is where we were at the beginning. He says, until, which is the hinge verse, until he, this is the one that we have sinned against. This is what, what's so upside down about the gospel. Until he, the one that we've broken the law, the one that we have offended, the one that we've rebelled against, until he pleads my case and establishes my cause. So just, just imagine you, you find yourself in big trouble. And you got to go visit the judge or you, you're going to arbitration and, and you, you're, you're waiting to go into the courtroom. And when you finally go into the courtroom, there's stack after stack after stack after stack, like six feet tall with all the things that you've done, about half of which you, you didn't confess. You, you just decided to keep living a secret life, thinking that what you bring into the light is what's going to come into the light. And all of a sudden, you see that they know everything. The judge knows everything. And all of a sudden, your heart sinks. And you're like, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. They know everything. And I deserve the wrath. But here's what makes this so powerful. Until he, the one that that is the wrath bearer until he pleads my case and establishes my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Now, let me tell you why this is so beautiful is that this is written 700 years before Jesus ever stepped on planet earth. And, and this, this prophet, Micah, he's like, listen, here's what I know. There's a time coming in the not too distant future where God himself the judge himself will come to planet earth and he will make a way in which our sins are not held against us. And so you never have to ask the question if you're a follower of Jesus, has my case been heard? Because you and I, we're standing here in this moment 2,700 years into the future. And so has your case been heard? Yeah, your case was heard when Jesus was on the cross and when he rose from the dead three days later. And not only did you he hear your case, but now your case is closed. Amen. And even more than that, you, if you're a Jesus person, you never have to ask the question, will I ever rise? Because Jesus is the firstborn of the resurrection. And all of us, we're sons and daughters of the resurrection, meaning you will rise. You may fall seven times or 77 times, but you will rise. Let me double down on this idea. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. The apostle Paul says this, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So the point of the gospel, the point of Jesus is not to make you a better person. You're dead. The point of the gospel is to take dead people and to make them alive people. So Paul's like, you, you, everybody, you're dead. Apart from Jesus, you're dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, can we just say those three words together? All of us. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. Now, this is where a lot of like pastors or preachers, like this is where they stop. Because like it's time for the altar call, you know, fire and brimstone. But we're going to keep going. And the reason is because a conjunction in scripture has the power to change everything. 
because the until in Micah chapter 7 is distinctly linked to the but because in Ephesians chapter 2. Meaning you and I, we were dead in our sins, deserving of the wrath of God, every one of us. But because, says Paul, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So even though I've fallen, I will rise. Even though you have fallen and you've fallen again and fallen again and fallen again, the power and the grace of Jesus will cause you to stand and to stand when no one else is standing. And no matter how far you've fallen and how many times you have fallen, the power of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead says you're a person You may fall, but you're identified as a person that rises. That's who you are. 